to think differently about uh, the employment challenge from the World Development Report to the work Gary has uh, uh, done on informality versus informality to country-specific case of labor reforms in South Africa. This is a rich menu. I'm sure it has uh, stimulated a lot of thinking in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in here. So can we now open up the floor for discussion, preferably uh, briefly each, so as to, to share the, uh, in the Professor Kabar. Yes, please. Excuse me. Thank you very yes. much. If you can remember to introduce yourselves. So I certainly will. Thank you. Please. My name is Francie Lund, and I'm from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Development Studies. And I'm also from an organization called WIGO, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. I'd really like to draw a link. This is not so much a question as just a comment. A, a strong link between what Ravi was talking about at the book launch about the, the, the idea of the, the, the bias towards a Westphalian conception of the state in the sense of we keep on looking at national sovereign governments as the main unit of analysis when looking at development. Uh, and link that to, to Gary's very strong story of Masabisi and Durban and the, the folly, the illogic of a municipal regulation that goes against a kind of job, job creation. So you have um, at national level, and I'm not talking about the South African situation, I'm talking about in general. At Nash, we, when we say let's look at, national, at policy reform, we usually are meaning at the national level. Yeah? But in fact, on the ground, um, different countries, through their constitution or through history, through both, allocate different competencies to local government. And in South Africa, as it happens, our local governments have a tremendous amount of power over the actual possibility of implementing what can be quite progressive um, national policies into policies on the ground that enable people to work. So, and, and in our in Durban, my home, my home city, um, it's the control, it's the city's control over the public spaces in which the majority of informal workers work that is absolutely critical to whether job creation, enterprise creation can succeed or not. So on the one hand, you have the a new, last week for heaven's sake, a, a new ministry of micro-enterprises being appointed, it will make no difference whatsoever. And from the on high, the president's office, we have yet another statement saying that there'll be a million jobs created by the end of next year. This will not happen. At the same, in the same week as the Durban municipality expels a couple of hundred bead sellers from their place in the market where they are paying licenses, they want a negotiation over the terms for which they will continue making their payments and the negotiations break down. So just to um, conclude also with um, referring back to Martin, your, your, your thing about voice and the operation of voice, that for informal workers, another, a space for representation of informal workers needs to be enduring and sustainable platforms for negotiation at the local level, as well as those informal workers participating just the other day now in the international labor organizations, discussions on formalizing the informal economy, and as well as participating in national mechanisms for organization and representation of workers of various sorts. Thank you. Roger Williamson, Institute of Development Studies. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Haroon a question, please. Uh, first of all, I thought there were three excellent papers. I thought it was really, uh, really great. Uh, Haroon, could you comment on the analysis by Maletti and Becky that basically the Africana elite was better at protecting uh, key industries and creating jobs for their people than the uh, reforms since the end of apartheid have been in creating jobs for black people, that black economic empowerment, which at one level should have created the kind of jobs you're talking about, really hasn't had traction and hasn't succeeded in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, Rose here. 
Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I think I've enjoyed the, the presentations. I have a can question. You, can you introduce yourself? Oh, you, you I'm like... Rose Ngugi. I'm from the IMF. Um, I have a question for Gary. Um, Either I missed uh, what you told the policeman, but uh, I would have, uh, I'm very curious uh, uh, what you told the policeman and what you would have told the Labour Minister if you met uh, with the Labour Minister later on. I'm raising this because um, uh, what you find is that uh, um, for some people who work in the informal sector, be it uh, hawkers or uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, people you are talking about in the beach, uh, the the law side will always argue for insecurity that is brought up by uh, this kind of informality. Uh, we've also, we also see sometimes uh, uh, the lawmakers yeah, running after, for example, Masimbi. I think it was very good that she was given um, a 24 hours notice. Uh, there are situations where they will come in and they will uh, pull down all their, 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 their kiosks. I'm just wondering uh, whether this is a, well, uh, of, of course, uh, uh, Rama talked about the voice issue, but I'm just wondering um, what, what is it that we miss out? Uh, we are talking about insecurity, we want the informal sector, and what is it that, who is missing what in, the, in that relationship? Uh, the second question I have is uh, to Rama. You brought out very clearly uh, that uh, jobs are transformational. And then you've shown that uh, various economies have differences in terms of the type of jobs. And then later on, uh, as you are concluding, you brought in uh, some characteristics uh, that jobs would take for the transformational uh, element. But I, couldn't, I just wanted you to, to link for us. Uh, how do you link the type of jobs that you indicated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the characteristics in optimizing uh, uh, job creation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Naila Kabir from the London School of Economics. Uh, I have uh, three quick questions for each of the panelists. Uh, Martin, I wanted to ask you the, the point you made about mice and gazelles, and that in developing countries very few mice become gazelles. And I wondered what implication you were drawing from that in terms of uh, you know, promoting jobs in those countries. Um, Harun, I wondered why the wage subsidy come employment was only for young African female workers. I was curious as to why you focused on females. And Gary, your, your, your description of, um, you know, you either sell your labor services to an employer or to yourself, I found that I couldn't get my head around that because I thought, okay, I see I sell labor services to employer. If I am a subsistence farmer, I sell services to myself. But if I'm a self-employed hairdresser, am I selling those services to myself? I'm not selling them to myself, nor to an employer. So I wondered if your categorization had somehow missed out on a particular way of thinking about self-employment. Can mm. we have two last ones? Yes, colleague there and... Thank you, my name is Anthony from the University of Southern Denmark. Two questions to Professor Harun. One is on the, you actually, uh, presented a very interesting finding in South Africa and that uh, uh, reforms tend to have negative effects on agriculture. I'm curious to know what are the mechanisms because at the end of the presentation, you also argue that uh, uh, trade union that does do appear not to matter and at the same time it appears to have a connection with the judicial system. So I, I'm, I'm actually interested to know what are the mechanisms through which the, the legal reforms could actually have a negative impact on agriculture. And my second question is, it has something to do with the uh, wage skill premium in South Africa. I'm interested also, I'm curious to know, what is the composition? You argue that uh, uh, the employment is quite capital intensive in the sense that my mining sector tend to absorb a lot of uh, technical skills. So I'm interested to know um, how much of job creation and job destruction has been done in South Africa in terms of all these technical innovations that come and go uh, back and forth. Uh, and and, and in, the, in the same line of reasoning, then what is the age composition? Does it affect youth mostly or uh, middle-aged or what happens then to like old people and so on and so forth? Thank you. Okay, can we conclude this round? And then we have a response from 
All right, my name is Joseph Tufua from University of Professional Studies, uh, Ghana. Uh, of late, I've been thinking about the uh, type of research that uh, we do at the university and the way they are integrated into policy research. Uh, it's been a concern to me. For example, through all these presentations, um, we've seen the academic way of presenting and doing the research. My concern is how are these uh, results uh, being integrated into actual policy? We see the universities that like research institutes uh, doing their own research, coming out with um, results that are good, but the politicians are also in another side of it, sometimes without any link to what the researchers uh, or research institutes are doing. How, how are all this integrated into policy such that as we do the research, we undertake the studies, we find all sorts of uh, results that are interesting, which would influence uh, policy making. But the policy makers seem to be sometimes different. For example, the parliament or the Ministry of Finance or the Central Bank uh, seem to be doing their own things. Um, apart from uh, what the research institutes are also doing. So that is, that is my uh, issue. How are we integrating all this from the perspective of developing countries? Thank you. Okay, that's a challenge to all of us. Now let's uh, have a response from, uh, we start with uh, Martin. Um, thank you, Sam. There were two questions addressed to me, two big questions, but I will try to, to stick to like a minute or two on each. Um, by Rose, how to link the challenge, the job challenge, to the implications we derive in terms of policy. Let me say that we are working on a volume um, with all the different cases, because the way we went about it was to ask for a second opinion. We asked teams in developing countries, we chose for each of our challenges a country that was a good representation of the challenge, and we asked local teams, not World Bank teams, to try to use this framework and make that connection. So what is your biggest job challenge and therefore what is the policy most appropriate? And our cases were like Bangladesh for an urbanizing economy, Mozambique uh, for an agrarian economy, uh, Tunisia for a country with high youth unemployment, and so on and so forth. So we picked up eight countries which were like a caricature of an illustration of a jobs challenge. And that will come up in a separate volume with a, the analytical framework, so the, the more technical part. So, these are things that were behind the World Development Report and now we want to, to, to put in the public domain that should be ready soon. But the idea is that um, through your diagnosis that combines triangulation of these sources, household data, enterprise data, values, you get with an idea that you have one big problem. And general countries are quite clear in identifying what their big problem is. Uh, it can be a combination of two. If I take a uh, place like Mozambique, you have a lot of people in agriculture and how to make agriculture more productive is certainly a big challenge because that's where uh, poverty reduction will happen to a large extent. But you need also the traction of uh, Maputo, Corridor, whatever, the, the dynamic of jobs. Um, and then we go to the policies uh, that could get more of that transformation in each case. And that's where we looked at the successful countries, how they had done it. And for instance, in the case of agriculture, what comes as a realization is that if you think from a jobs perspective into agriculture, it is not necessarily the development of commercial agriculture that will do the trick. It's smallholder farming. And the transformation of smallholder farming, before you can really go to commercial agriculture, is quite a lot that you can do. And that's where a lot of the focus is. We, in a case of Bangladesh, we thought that the way the country is urbanizing is extremely important uh, for the dynamic of jobs. When you take a country like uh, um, uh, the Ukraine, which we take, took as an aging society, the big challenge is you have an aging population and social security systems which are such that uh, for the same population you have fewer and fewer people producing. So you have a decline in living standards if nothing else is done. And therefore you think that the policies are how to extend the working age. And so in each case we came up with a set of policies that were quite removed from the labor market, or as Gary would say, that influence the labor market, but are outside it. As I said, for instance, in the case of Chile, is how you get the flow of resources from uh, copper, uh, a country that is a third of the reserves of copper in the world, not to become money that goes into creating public sector jobs, but that preserves the incentive for the private sector to work, and, and, and so on and so forth. And, then the response may be fiscal policy. So what was interesting is that in each case, we found that a decisive policy 
was not our traditional go and change the labor regulation. It was something else. It was agricultural policy, urbanization policy, fiscal policy, social security reform, and so on and so forth. That, that's, I think, the, the, the key message. On mice and gazelles, the, the question by Naila, I think to me we, at this point that, that's one of the fundamental questions we should be asking ourselves in development. We understand very little about the dynamic of economic units, uh, how they go from being a person with an idea to being a person who employs someone else to being a company, and that, that's where uh, a lot of the action happens. Uh, I think we have hypotheses. Uh, uh, but they are partial. For instance, there was a time when the dominant view was the kind of Fernando de Soto view. Everybody's an entrepreneur. This is stupid government with these stupid regulations that are getting on the way. Let's remove all that and we will thrive. We looked at that. We looked at studies as to who is an entrepreneur. What are the characteristics of individuals who are an entrepreneur across many countries? And we found that uh, it's more like Abhijit Banerjee or Esther Duflo will say, most of the people who are in these units are there for survivorship, not for entrepreneurship. There is something like three to five percent of them who have apparently the characteristics of entrepreneurs. So the first answer is not all mice will become gazelles, that's for sure. The question is how we get more of them. Uh, and just removing regulations for the 95 or 97 percent who are survivors may not do, the action will be elsewhere. Um, there is a second set of thoughts that is related to the type of support to provide. And there, uh, the, all of this randomized controlled trial literature is providing some interesting insights. Uh, people like uh, David McKenzie in the bank, Nick Bloom of the bank, are, are doing all sorts of interventions of giving these small units credit, formalizing them, paying a worker, uh, giving them capital, and seeing does it make a difference. Very few things make a difference. Uh, they are more optimistic about some forms of basic business training as uh, something that could make a difference. But this kind of support, I said, uh, to me what Harun said, public procurement policies that create space for anything from recycling, garbage recycling, and others, for people who are at the border of survivorship to become integrated in, in a formal uh, structure. This is an, another potential area. My suspicion, and, and that's the area in, in which we are trying to work a lot, uh, in South Asia now, is that uh, what creates the dynamism of firms has a lot to do with how, how cities are organized. And again, the stories by Harun uh, and others about South Africa, you can think that is a place that one can read as a place with very high uh, uh, unemployment or a v place with very low level of micro enterprises because of the uh, legacy of apartheid that created completely separated cities where people live in one place and, and jobs are in another place, and especially the jobs where the rich part of the city are, are difficult, very difficult to access, even transportation is expensive. When I think about the experience of uh, China and Vietnam, I think Vietnam is a very interesting case in terms of having lots of gazelles. In Vietnam, when you look at the structure of employment, it went from farming to self-employment, and then to wage employment, and self-employment started declining. And a lot of these informal enterprises, after the enterprise law, uh, of 2000 was passed, Le Dan Zhuang was around, he was the father of, of that law. A lot of them formalized it, which showed that they were moving into something else. And to me, the way East Asian cities are organized, which is very compact, with villages that have been engulfed into the city rather than resettled elsewhere, uh, with the tube houses where people have their shop at the ground floor and uh, sleep at the top floor, so the distance between people and jobs is like down the stairs or up the stairs. That's basically the kind of distance you have to go. It has a lot to do with that. This is a hypothesis that we have seen uh, in industrial countries. There is increasingly a literature for small businesses and to how different cities nurture these dynamics. We don't have the equivalent for developing countries. So we are into a big spatial research uh, project of trying to understand which cities, density, skill mix, economic diversification, have more of the emergence of gazelles. So it's a different line. One is regulation, one is support, one is spatial organization. If I had to bet today, I will bet on the spatial organization. Thank you very much. Uh, Gary? I also had two questions that were addressed specifically to me, and I'll answer them briefly. Qu on the question of what would I have told the labor minister and who is missing what, um, I used to work on South Africa, and go there pretty regularly and it stopped and it stopped for a very good reason and that is uh, I tried to tell the South African Department of Labor uh, what I 
thought they might consider doing and they didn't want to hear it. Uh, okay, what, they, what I thought they should consider doing was perhaps using some of their resources in order to try to uh, create more jobs, but not the ones with the very high minimum wages and all of the social protections and labor legislation and other sorts of things. And when I say they didn't want to hear it, they just said, we don't want to hear it. Uh, they said, uh, we fought the struggle against apartheid, we won. And every time we get more workers into good covered jobs, we win again. Um, and so basically they said, don't go away mad, just go away. And so I went away. Uh, now, the other question was, uh, uh, the, uh, how, to, how to think about self-employed people selling one's services to oneself. And here's how I think about that. And that is, suppose you're a hairdresser, to continue with your example, and you're a hairdresser and you work for a, a hairdressing salon. And so what you do is you sell your labor services to the owner of the salon. The owner of the salon then uh, pays you a, a wage and you uh, uh, cut people's hair. Now, suppose that there is no owner of a salon. Uh, you um, sell your labor services to yourself, you uh, cut people's hair, and they pay you money. Okay? That's essentially the same kind of relationship. You cut hair, you get money for it. And that's uh, how I think about that. Well, what's different then is that the, uh, who, is, um, who is paying the money to whom? Whether it's the employer paying money to you or you're paying the money to yourself, you're still getting paid for cutting the same hair. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Harun. Um, so just quickly, I know we're running out of time. The, uh, the black economic empowerment question, I think it's important to, uh, I think it was Roger, um, the, it's important to differentiate between uh, so, so in most countries, you have either protection of minorities or you have um, some sort of special program for interest groups, be they previously marginalized or ethnic groups and so on. And so the Black Economic Empowerment Program within South Africa is, is, is an obvious example of that. But it has two components, as, to, as do most of these programs. One is public sector transformation, and the second is the economic empowerment component. And the public sector transformation one has been phenomenally successful. So if you look at all the numbers in terms of uh, um, uh, racial transformation of the public sector, it's been, it's been an unbridled success. Um, changing economic ownership patterns, um, less so in the context of what has happened as uh, almost an unintended consequence of the good intentions of a state trying to redistribute wealth. Uh, from sort of previously white hands to black hands. All that happened was that the corporate sector behaves as every corporate sector does, which is in the self-interest and maximize their, um, their return by providing financing for deals um, on ownership of companies for the well-networked and those closer to the political elite. And so effectively what you got was black economic enrichment rather than empowerment. And that was an unintended consequence. This is not to suggest that there's a deliberate strategy, it was just a consequence looking down the line. And so as a, uh, because of that, the state has now instituted a broad-based black economic empowerment scheme. I still think the real solution, going back, to, so I'm glad Martin brought it up, is around public sector procurement. I think if the state can crack public sector procurement access to micro-enterprises, to the, the informal sector, and there are clever ways of doing that, then I think you can, get to, uh, you, you can get to a route where your BEE policy, if you like, uh, is transformative. Um, there are few, uh, the young African female workers was indicative, um, to just to show the targeting of the incentive scheme. I should say that the wage subsidy scheme is now policy of government, so it's, and it's called an employment incentive scheme. Um, so and, and it's for everybody. Um, so it's not just for young workers. Um, the uh, the main reason we had job losses in agriculture was the minimum wage, not not anything to do with trade unions. You've got capital intensive mining and knowledge intensive financial and business services that provide the skills premium, and that's the, that's the bedrock of this growth strategy in terms of the labour market. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the team has been great. We have borrowed uh, some 12 minutes from our 
break, but I think it was worth it. The returns from that borrowing are very high.